Hi everyone, welcome to day two of Diana Initiative and we'll be having another session with another speaker today. So thanks to the previous speaker and first of all, going to the speaker track, I just wanted to thank our track sponsors. That is INE eLearn Security, Exonius, MongoDB, Juniper Networks, Colight, Google, we Hack Purple and Bridge Crew by Prisma Cloud. Really, really thankful to the sponsors for making it and making Diana's initiative so big. So today we have our speaker, Christina Jones, who will be uh, talking about work smarter, not harder, concolic execution for CTF. Christina Jones is a cybersecurity in engineer at M Mitra with over 10 years of experience. She has worked in a variety of areas, including web application assessment, Android forensics, incident response, and most recently, she has started working on reverse engineering. Her research interests lie at the intersection of automating binary analysis and malware reverse engineering. She has taught multiple intro to CTF workshops, volunteers with the Cyber Jitsu Girls Academy, enjoys participating in CTFs to build her skills and helping others to do the same. So I welcome you, Christina, and good luck for your session. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Christina, and I'm going to be talking about something I think is really cool, concolic execution. We're going to talk about what it is and how it can be used to solve reverse engineering CTF challenges. So an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why use automation in the first place. Um, and then we're going to talk about a specific uh, automated analysis technique called concolic execution uh, and two, uh, two technologies and tools that are uh, useful for concolic execution. So Anger, a binary analysis framework, and Z3, an SMT solver. Um, you can think of an SMT solver as a tool that you can give an equation with unknown variables and it will tell you if that equation is satisfiable. If it is, it'll give you values for those variables. However, it's possible it might not solve this in a reasonable time, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, we'll then be applying these tools and techniques to three example CTF problems. They won't be full walkthroughs because that would take too long, but we're gonna be focusing on how these tools specifically can help you solve the challenge. Um, as you might've guessed, this is a pretty large topic. Uh, it could probably do uh, multiple days, a deep dive into this, but the goal of this talk is to give you a foundation to explore this uh, on your own. So uh, why automation? Uh, the simple answer is to get your flags faster so you can get more points so you can win the CTF. Um, but even if that wasn't your goal, uh, some of the most difficult classes of reverse engineering challenges uh, can require some sort of automation. So it might be the scale of the problem. Uh, each part of uh, each, you might have hundreds of binaries to analyze and each part might not be that complicated, but the sheer number of them is too much to do by hand, or it could be there's complex comp uh, computation or obfuscation that would be unreasonable to solve in a, a weekend if you didn't do some sort of automation to help you out. So concolic execution. Uh, concolic execution is a portmanteau of symbolic and concrete execution. So symbolic execution is a software testing technique that was first explored in the 70s uh, for the purpose of software verification. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was renewed research in this area due to improvements in SMT solvers, as well as uh, additional computation power, such that these techniques were more feasible than they were when they were originally uh, proposed. Uh, so concolic execution is uh, one of these, uh, one of the results of this uh, research. It is uh, techniques to combine symbolic and concrete execution. And the reason for this is to enable strategies to overcome some of the challenges with pure symbolic execution. And we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. So here we have an example program. Uh, it takes some input. It has a few compares, 
and then it enters uh, one of two states. And so maybe we are really interested in the print foo state for whatever reason. Maybe that's a bad outcome. We're worried about it. We want to know what are the possible inputs that could lead to uh, that state. So some of the options we have for this would be to start trying random uh, variables or values for x. So just kind of uh, blindly guessing, or uh, maybe an exhaustive search so we knew what everything we had tried. Uh, a third technique is symbolic execution, which is what we're going to talk about. So here we have uh, the symbolic analysis tree uh, drawn out for our example program. So at the beginning, we're going to uh, say that uh, the variable we care about x, the input, is going to be symbolic. So we'll assign it to alpha. And then y is assigned a zero by the program. So you come to the first branch. If x is greater than 6, you take the true path. If it's less, you take the false path. And the great thing about symbolic execution is that it analyzes both paths. So with a normal execution, you'd have to test the value and then see which way you went. Um, this way, you can explore both simultaneously. So if we take the true branch, we now have a state that um, alpha has to be greater than 6, because that was the condition and y is now equal to 3. And the constraints to uh, follow this path were that alpha was greater than 6. So for our next uh, branch statement, we have uh, x plus y is equal to 9. So uh, now the true path says that uh, our state remains the same, but we add an additional constraint that alpha plus y is equal to 9. And so we, we do that for all, all the paths through the program. So now when we, uh, we are, so the state we we're interested in was foo. So we're going to look at the specific uh, state and constraint data for states where uh, we print foo. So for the first one, uh, we can solve the, we give the constraints to our SMT solver and the SMT solver tells us that's unsatisfiable. There's not a number that is greater than six that you can add to y and you get to nine. Uh, so, so we know that it's not possible to come down this path to get to foo. However, the other uh, state, which prints foo, had alpha less than or equal to 6. And so the SMT solver will tell us, in order to satisfy the constraints for, for that state, alpha would have to be 6. Or 6 is one value, at least, that would um, get you to that path. So. This chart is not so much meant to be read. Uh, it's from Wikipedia. It is the uh, symbolic execution frameworks that uh, are on Wikipedia. So you can see there's a lot of them, and a lot of them are open source, which is really exciting. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about one of them, which is Anger. Uh, so, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so an overview of Anger. Anger is a Python open source binary analysis framework. Uh, it's on GitHub. It was developed by UCSB as part of their 2016 DARPA Grand Challenge entry. Uh, the goal of the DARPA Grand Challenge was to create automated defensive systems to find bugs and patch them. Uh, it has a large community with continued development and uh, great documentation. So it's frequently updated and uh, They've taken, you know, something that's pretty complicated to make, and I think through their documentation, they've made it uh, about as understandable as you probably could. So um, I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, so these are some of the components that make up Anger. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about. So uh, the project is the overarching structure that holds um, the analysis information. So you uh, give it the path to your binary and uh, you're going to be using it like throughout your analysis. Um, CLI is the loader that loads your binary. Uh, it has multi-architecture multi support. Uh, it stands for CLI loads everything. Um, the solver, the, we talked a little bit about SMT solvers. So uh, the library they use is Clarify. It looks uh, similar to Z3. It uses Z3 in the back end. Um, and it looks kind of similar to uh, Z3's Python uh, interface. 
Sim states are how you um, look at and manipulate uh, state data. So for each basic block that you go, your analysis goes through, you can uh, set and read memory information, register information for that state and execution. And then the simulation manager is how you uh, run your analysis. The there's multiple execution engines. One possible option is Unicorn, which is a emulator, which can uh, speed up your analysis. And uh, the other main um, execution engine is based on VEX, which uh, uses the um, VEX intermediate representation. Uh, so diving in a little bit to the uh, solver, so this is what the syntax of the solver is going to look like. You can create um, bit vectors, uh, which are um, concrete values, and you can also create symbolic vectors. So that is really important uh, for you know symbolic execution, right? The the values that we want to solve for, we're going to make symbolic vectors. Um, then you can create uh, you can access the solver through ClaraPy. Um, and add constraints. So those are the that's the equation part of what the constraints have to be for uh, how your variables inter um, interact. And then you can ask uh, Clarify to evaluate your symbolic variable. So um, you know you can ask it to give you a value that uh, satisfies that equation, or to tell you that it can't. So I've uh, mentioned Z3 a couple times. Z3 is an SMT solver again. Uh, it was created by Microsoft Research. It's uh, the current solver in ClaraPy used by Anger. It um, has its uh, it uses a domain specific language, but it also has a lot of different uh, language bindings. So there is there are Python bindings, so you can program it in Python, which is really great. And it is also open source and on GitHub. Uh, so it can be used on its own to solve certain problems, which we'll talk about also. Uh, so like I mentioned, sim, sim states before, uh, after you create your project, you want to create uh, an entry state to, to begin your execution. So this is sort of uh, the, the beginning of what your, your program is. And so to that first state, you can add uh, constraints on the memory and registers to the solver that it can use as it does its analysis. Uh, this simulation engine, uh, you pass the state that you want to explore, and there's a few different options for exploration. So you can step, which will advance you one basic block at a time. You can ask it to explore and give it a find address or a find um, equation or you can tell it uh, an equation or an address that you want to avoid, or both. And uh, there's also an option to just tell it to run, so it will run until it terminates. Uh, and like I mentioned before, Unicorn and Vax are part of the simulation engine. Uh, so we've covered a little bit of the theory behind some block execution and some of the real specifics to using Anger. So now we're going to talk about how you can get all the flags. So a lot of reverse engineering CTF problems have this uh, map nicely to the find avoid uh, construct. So you, you know, you take some input, it checks, uh, it runs a function against that, it uh, returns a result, and then there's this if statement of if it's this thing, you win. Otherwise, try again or no. So you want to find the state that uh, prints you win, and you want to avoid, uh, obviously, the state that says try again. You don't want to try again. You just want the flag. <laughs> so this is an example from last year's Diana CTF. Um, I've pulled part of it out uh, from the GDRG compiler. So uh, you can do some RE on the challenge. It calls a function on the input, and then it checks those bytes against an array that it, it has. Uh, if something doesn't match, it tells you nope. And if everything matches, you you found the flag. So uh, we're going to use that uh, 
with uh, Angers Explorer functionality. So to create our Angers script, we're going to start with a project. Uh, and then we're going to create the symbolic variable for our input. So uh, we're using ClarePy here to create a array of symbolic bytes um, for the length of the input. So through reverse engineering, we figured out this is how long our flag should be. Uh, we then concatenate the, that array together uh, to create our flag input. And then we use the entry state uh, to create the beginning of our challenge. And then the arguments are for Linux, the name of the binary, and then this challenge takes uh, a parameter as input. So we put our symbolic input there, and we're going to use the option to use anger or to use unicorn to uh, speed up our analysis. So now that we have the state created, we want to add constraints based on the information we know about um, the challenge. So this will help uh, anger solve it faster. It reduces uh, the space that it has to search for an answer. So we know, for example, that uh, our flag is going to be printable characters. So we can tell it that uh, each of those bytes should be less than the top end of the ASCII range and greater than the, the bottom. And if it's a CTF that has a really specific flag format, you could uh, put constraints on the first few uh, bytes to say they sh it should match the, the flag format. So to run the simulation, we have two options. We can use the explore functionality to give it the uh, find the address of the flag print statement and avoid the nope print statement. Or we can just say, I want to run the whole analysis and then I'll look at the results afterwards. So once it's run, we want to get results. If you choose the explore strategy, you, um, so uh, I should explain that the simulation manager as it's running, it uses stashes to keep track of the states it has. So. Uh, it will have an active stash, which are states that are still being explored or states to explore, a dead-ended stash, which are states that have reached the end of execution. And if you're using explore, it will have, it will put states into found or uh, avoid. So um, we can, hopefully the CTF challenge only has one answer. So you can look at the first found state and then use the solver to evaluate for each byte in our symbolic variable to get the flag. If you chose to use the run stat strategy, you can look through all of the uh, dead-ended states for the output, that's the flag. So you want the state where you got to that, um, that's the flag statement, and you can look for that in standard out. And then you would evaluate the same way, asking the solver to evaluate each uh, character of the flag. So to recap that challenge, um, the things you needed to find uh, via reverse engineering for the challenge were the length of the flag and the address of the fail and win states or the successful print statement. So you still have to do some RE. You don't get out of all of it, but um, you do have to do maybe less. <laughs> So uh, this challenge was from uh, Redpone uh, 2020. Uh, it took a flag as input using fgets. It, uh, the length of the flag was 73 bytes. And then it did a series of compares for each byte of the flag against the other characters in the flag itself. So this is a small output of, um, you can see it moves two different parts of the array into registers, compares them, and then it jumps based on that comparison. And it was a, a, a little bit trickier in that the, the, this initial jump label was not always, there was an, a second jump to the actual fail statement. So you couldn't just look, you can just rename one of these fail and then like quickly uh, see which way you wanted to do the compare. Um, so, so the name of the, the challenge was Smart Solver. Um, 
So our script would look pretty similar to, even though there's that uh, second jump, um, it would look pretty similar to the, the first script. However, there were two library calls in this challenge, which um, were causing execution to take longer than was really feasible. So um, one thing you can do if you know that you have one output or a simpler output for those library calls is you can hook the library calls with anger. So we knew the length of the string we were giving it, and uh, we knew that we were only going to give it alphanumeric characters. So we could create hooks for these two functions so that they return something quick um, and speed up the analysis. So an alternative solution, and most of the uh, write-ups that I saw for this challenge uh, use Z3. So the challenge is this series of compares, so it maps really nicely to Z3 constraints. Uh, however, you'd probably still want to do some automation because there were around 5,000 compares. <laughs> so you'd probably want to automate parsing the compares and translating that into um, Z3 to, um, in order to solve it. But it's, this is one that would be possible to do with uh, Z3 and you wouldn't have to use um, Anger. So what are some of the things you might ask yourself to, to decide, do I want to try Anger or Z3? So if the binary has some properties which make uh, Anger challenging to use, like maybe lots of system calls, or you can't write a, a hook that simplifies them, or if it's written in a language that has a lot of uh, runtime calls, like maybe Go or Rust, then that's going to be really hard for Anger to turn through. So if it's feasible to extract uh, constraints, like that, then um, if that's fairly easy, then Z3 is probably the way to go. So the last example challenge we're going to talk about is uh, Flare 2018 Magic. So in this example, uh, we're going to solve a we're going to use Angular to solve a subcomponent of the problem. So um, a high level overview of this challenge. Uh, it was pretty complex, so there's lots of details I'm leaving out. But uh, the input was broken into 33 different pieces, and each piece was passed to one of seven algorithms uh, to check. And then the order of the algorithms was scrambled, and this was repeated 666 times. So Anger does have support for self modifying code through Unicorn, but uh, 666 of those might still be a, a lot. I'm not sure. I didn't. Um, my attempts at solving it without breaking it out didn't work, but maybe you could. Um, so it's too large to just fire and forget, but can we divide the problem up? So what I did was I extracted each algorithm while using a script and script, and then I asked Anger to solve for uh, each piece of the key uh, for each algorithm. So once you do that, the other 665 keys can be calculated. Um, so you only need it to solve that first key. So um, the extracted programs are not full programs. They're just shell code, right? Because they are called from within, within the program. But that's not a problem. Anger has support for, for shell code, uh, so you can load the shell code into a project, and then you can create a blank state. Um, so one option that is helpful is this uh, zero fill unconstrained memory. So if you know that you're going to have a lot of memory that you're, um, you're, you know, there won't be the setup code from regular program execution, this can really help uh, speed speed things up if, if it's OK for that not to be symbolic. Um, so the shell code expected three arguments. So uh, one of those was our uh, the part that it was checking, so that we made symbolic. And then uh, we used concrete variables for uh, the two others that we knew. So uh, starting with a blank initial state, there's going to be a lot that uh, the program expects. So don't necessarily try to, to read this, but it's more to illustrate that you can store information in memory for the initial state. You can set registers 
And if you're doing something with shell code, you might need to do that because you're going to be missing context for program execution that that shell code expects. Um, and then this was an example where there wasn't, there were multiple uh, requirements for the find state. So uh, you can define a function that um, asks questions about the, the state of the program. So uh, have I returned from this function? So this was the return address that I put on the stack so I can find it. Um, and what are there certain registers I care about? So in this case, the return value of one indicated that uh, it was successful. So you can pass this function to uh, explore's find variable and uh, it, will, it will find it for you. So uh, to summarize that challenge, uh, we can use automation to extract the parts of code we need, and then we can solve for the key using Angular. So obviously there's still a lot of other work to do. It's not a push button solution, but uh, you didn't have to, this allowed you to not re-implement each of those seven, seven algorithms and reverse those individual functions. Um, and then, there was a key scrambling algorithm. So once you had the first key, if you re-implemented their key scrambling, you could get all the keys, feed it back to the binary and uh, get the flag. So um, we've seen three examples with uh, where symbolic execution, concolic execution really helped us out a lot, but it's important to remember that there's no silver bullet, uh, there are challenges that you want to think about when you're writing your scripts. So path explosion, uh, where you create a lot of state really quickly is, is one, um, you might run out of resources. Loops and recursion are two uh, things that um, can cause that to happen. So you'll want to watch for that and just kind of, you know, anything you can think of to reduce the amount of state it's gonna create, any more constraints you can give to it is going to help it uh, solve uh, in a faster time. And then also uh, library and system call modeling. There's a lot, uh, they're called sim procedures. There's a lot that come with anger, but um, sometimes they return symbolic variables, right? They, they can't make assumptions about your program. So if there's stuff you know about the program you're analyzing that you can tell anger, that's going to, to help you out. Uh, so in conclusion, concolic execution is not just for academics. Uh, you too can use it to solve all the CTF problems uh, faster and maybe even some challenges that otherwise would have taken you way too long. Um, but it's important to remember there, there are limitations. So, uh, you know, you have to engineer around those. Uh, these are some resources. Uh, Angers documentation, like I mentioned before, is really good. So there's a lot of it, so it can be a little inundating. Uh, I recommend reading it in conjunction with looking at this uh, CTF, the Angular CTF. Uh, Angular CTF is, uh, I think, really cool. It has a lot of scaffolding code. It's meant for you to learn. So um, it's a great resource. And reading about the um, reading about the components while you're using them, you know, kind of helps reinforce that. And there's also a Ghidra plugin out there for Anger, um, which is pretty neat. So that's all. Thanks. I guess, are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much, Christina. That was really, really amazing. And uh, I really appreciated, and I guess every one of us here agreed, the mention of the codes, like showing off codes, uh, was really helpful and uh, really got a good hold of you know, uh, how and what can go around. Uh, OK, so the question we have here, uh, you spoke about multiple exit criteria where you were looking for an exit from a library. Could you explain a little on this? Um, so I, um, like, I think, I think the question is asking about that, the function I showed where I said there was, it wasn't just, you wanted to get to an address. So, um, for, in the first few I showed just getting to a state where the address said, um, you win meant that you got the flag, but there are cases like, for example, the shell code that I was pulling out that it could exit 
and I wouldn't necessarily know if it was successful or not. So I had to add another um, another value in there to say was the uh, return register RAX was that equal to one because that meant that it had been successful. Um, so yeah, that would be the case if you if there's not a single state where you can say this was successful, then you might have to say, well, I, I know that I need this memory to be this value, or I know that um, this return value should be there. So that's the case where you might wanna define a function. Thanks, Christina. I guess, Jenny, that answers your question. Um, I guess we're getting a lot of uh, appreciation pointers for you, Christina. And <laughs> I'm glad. Um, if you if uh, you think of a question later, feel free to reach out to me on the Diana Slack. It's just my name, Christina Johns. Um, also, Christina, if uh, you could just pen down those three links, uh, I guess uh, really uh, interested on having those three URLs which you just provided at the end. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and everyone, I've just uh, shared along uh, Christina's Twitter handle and how you can connect back to her on Diana Slack. Okay, the URLs are in. Great, great. Okay. Um, Jenny, yes, it would be available on YouTube. So you can check the Diana Initiative YouTube page. It will be later posted there. Um, apart from that, Christina, there's just one more question. Uh, you talk about use in CTFs. So what are some real world applications of SMT solvers? Uh, yeah, so um, SMT solvers are used in software verification. So I think that's um, why Microsoft did the research, right? They wanted to make their code better. Um, and the same with uh, concolic execution frameworks or binary analysis frameworks like Anger. Uh, that, so the DARPA Grand Challenge was specific to finding vulnerabilities in patching. So that's a really common use case. Um, but any sort of binary analysis that you would want to do, like um, there's certain uh, malware obfuscation techniques where concolic execution can really help simplify a um, terrible looking static analysis uh, situation. So uh, it can be used for, for that as well. Thanks, Christina. Uh, hope, Steve, that answers your question. Um, OK, the URLs look fine. Um, in that case, I guess um, if, if there are any more issues or any more questions regarding uh, her session, um, you can connect back with Christina on Diana's Slack. She's readily available there, and she can answer your questions there. And apart from that, I will just post a speaker survey here for her. So if you can just go back and give a small feedback to her, that would be really great. And apart from that, I would really want to encourage every one of you to just stop at the socials or the expo halls. There's some amazing events going on there. So it will be really great for all of you to be there and you know hang on there, network with people, and you know attend a lot of sessions at the expo hall. <laughs> Okay, great then. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone.